Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, being in Norway. It's a beautiful country. And uh, as Israelis, we don't, forgive that, uh, we don't forget that Norway was one of the uh, states that actually recognized Israel in 1949. So we have good feelings towards you people. Thank you. It was September 2000. It was the beginning of the Intifada in Israel. Suicide bombing, drive-by shooting, ambushes. And Israel calls to a special military call-up. Two soldiers are called to their base in Bet El. They took a car, they drove to their base, but they didn't know their way so well. They made a mistake. Mistake that turned to be the mistake of their life. They made a wrong turn to the city of Ramallah. In Ramallah, they were pulled out of their car by the policemen of the Palestinian Authority and brought to the police station in town. Very quickly, the rumor was spread that there are two Israeli soldiers arrested in the Palestinian police station. The mob began to arrive. They demanded the policemen to bring them down, the two soldiers. They wanted to lynch them. But the Palestinian policemen refused. Instead, they did the work for the mob. They used any tool they found in the police station. Metal poles, sticks, guns and knives. And for half an hour, they were beating the soldiers to death. But the mob demanded blood. So the Palestinian policeman took one of the soldiers, Vadim Nurjits, and threw his body from the second floor into the crowd. We all watched it on TV. We all remember the bloody hands from the window. And when the body was turned into the mob, the mud ripped it to shreds. They took out the internal organs of the body, they dragged it to the center of town and lit it on fire. By the end, when the body was turned into the Israeli forces, there was almost nothing left to say a prayer on. Me and my colleagues just finished law school, young lawyers, and as the rest of the world, we watched the videos. We saw the clips. We saw the bloody hands. And we knew that if this incident would have happened anywhere else in the world, the police and the state would be found responsible. It looked clear to us that the Palestinian police and the Palestinian Authority have to pay for this bloody lynching. The problem was that nobody took the Palestinian Authority to court. Nobody knew how to bring a terror entity into a court of law. We took the risk and we filed a lawsuit against the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian police in the court in Jerusalem. The Palestinian Authority hired a lawyer, an Israeli Arab from East Jerusalem that came to court, put a defense, and we started the trial. But in order for us to make sure that we'd be able to collect the judgment in the end of the day, we put a lien on the Palestinian Authority money. This is the tax money that Israel collects on a monthly basis and gives it in the end to the hands of the Palestinian Authority. We put a lien for the entire amount of the lawsuit 64 million shekels, which are equal to $16 million. $16 million is a lot of money for the PA. At the beginning of the Intifada, every bullet cost $1. $16 million are 16 million bullets that the Palestinian Authority could not aim against Jews and Israelis. And then, 
We thought that perhaps this is one of the ways to fight terrorism. Perhaps if you go after their money, you can bring the terrorism into a halt because money is the oxygen to terrorism. If you stop the flow of the money, maybe you can stop the flow of the terrorism. So we started filing lawsuits in Israel, in the United States, against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, PLO, Palestine Authority, against Iran, against Syria, and we started winning in court. So in 2002, when it was the peak of the Intifada, when the Dolphinarium discotheque in Tel Aviv got blown up and 28 teenagers got killed, and the Mormon Cafe in Jerusalem got blown up and 18 young people over coffee got killed, and the Park Hotel in Atania, 30 guests over Passover Seder getting massacred, we were approached by the Israeli Mossad, by the former head of the Mossad, Mayor Dagan, that had a special unit called Harpoon, which had the same task as we did, obstruct terror funding. They also realized that if they want to fight terrorism, one of the substantial steps you have to take is to cut off their funding. It was a unit, it was a secret unit until we wrote a book about it, and it's called Harpoon, and they had one mission, follow the money, target the money, kill the money. We are approached by this unit and we are asked if we, in addition to going after terror organizations and the state that sponsor them, can go after those who facilitate these transactions, the one that makes sure that money flows from the headquarters of Hamas in Syria, in Jordan, into the hands of the Palestinian terror organizations in the West Bank and Gaza. Go after the banks. We agreed. And the first case we filed was a case against a major bank in the Arab world called the Arab Bank. Not a very creative name, but that's its name. The Arab Bank is based in Jordan, but it has branches all over the world. It's got over $30 billion in assets. And during the Intifada, the Arab Bank ran a reward program in favor of the families of the suicide bombers which went like this. If you were a father or a mother of a suicide bomber, if you were a child of a suicide bomber, you could have gone to the Hamas headquarters in Gaza, get a letter from them saying that you are a relative of the suicide bomber, show the letter to the bank manager of the Arab bank in Gaza, and the bank manager will give you a reward of many thousands of dollars. Not only that, the Arab bank puts ads all over the Arab world. If you want to support your brothers in the Palestinian Authority, if you want to help the Shaheed, the martyrs, donate money to the specific bank account in Gaza. People in Saudi Arabia knew that if they donate money to the specific bank account in Gaza, they can go back home, sit in their living rooms, and watch the ambulances taking away the bodies of the dead and the injured in Jerusalem. The Arab Bank could have continued with this reward program and let's say made a little mistake. They ran this program while having a branch in New York. We saw that and realized that there is an American jurisdiction over the bank. Along with American lawyers, we filed a lawsuit against the Arab Bank in New York seeking over $5 billion compensations. First thing the Arab Bank did was trying to close its branch in New York. The Congress didn't let them to do so. After a long negotiation, they had to freeze $450 million of their assets in the United States, and then they didn't have a choice but to litigate the case. They filed motion to dismiss the case, but all their motions were denied. The court ordered them to turn into our hands all the documentation of the transaction that they did from the beginning of the Intifada. And there was a paper trail that proved that the Arab Bank gave money to the families of the suicide bombers knowingly and intentionally. We thought the Arab Bank would compromise, but they did not. Instead, they went to trial. It was a jury trial. 
It lasted 50 days, and in the end of the trial, the bank lost the case. <laughs> and only then, they settled on the damages. And the damages are horrible. Hannah Nachenberg, for instance, was 21 years old when she decided to take her family to eat pizza in the Sparrow Pizza Place in Jerusalem in August 2001. Shortly after she entered the restaurant, the suicide bomber from the Hamas, holding a guitar case full of explosive, entered the restaurant. And then he sat down, ate a slice of pizza, and blew himself up. Hannah Nachenberg did not get killed in the attack. A metal pin entered her head and lied in her brain. She went into irreversible coma. She was hospitalized in Adassa Hospital in Jerusalem, and after many months that the doctors saw there was no improvement in her situation, she was moved to a medical center in Israel. She's staying there until this day. Every day, her parents come to the hospital, sit near her bed, and pray. I've seen photos of Hannah's daughter, five years old Sarah, dressed up in Purim custom, coming to show her mother how she will dress up in Purim that year. I've seen photos of Hannah's brother, dressed up in his tuxedo wedding suit, coming to show his sister how he'll dress up in his wedding day. Every single day, her parents come to the hospital, enter her room, sit near her bed, and pray. The family of Han Nachmer will receive compensations, but this wasn't the achievement of the case. This lawsuit sent a shockwave through the international banking system that not only the Arab banks shut down the accounts of Hamas, but all the banks in the Western world stopped immediately all financial services to designated organization. No bank agreed to open bank account to Hamas, Islamic Jihad, PLO. No bank agreed to provide financial services to Islamic charities that identified with their organization. And no bank agreed to operate in terror zones like South Lebanon, like Gaza. There is no banking system in Gaza. This is why we see them smuggling money into Gaza in suitcases, in cash. This is why when Israel wants to provide the Gaza Strip with some cash. They have to bring a messenger from Qatar with suitcases in cash through the border. And that caused Hamas a great deal of harm because they need to bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Gaza Strip. They run a government in order to continue shooting missiles towards Israel from a populated area, from kindergarten, from schools, from houses in order to use the population in Gaza as human shields, order them to go to the border, to the fence with Israel, to cut through the fence in order to let the militants go right after behind them to kidnap Israeli soldiers and citizens. They have to pay the population a lot of money and provide them with all services they need from cradle to grave. Hamas in support his military, they have tens of thousands of soldiers. Sometimes they wear uniforms, most of the time they don't, but they always get paid on a monthly basis. Hamas needs to support his prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail. It's not only the Palestinian Authority that pays their money. There is a big competition between the Palestinian Authority to Hamas who pays more. Hamas pays between $500 to $3,000 per month depends what the sentence of the prisoner is, which depends on the number of Israelis he killed. And Hamas keeps building their underground tunnels, keep bringing ammunition into Gaza, missiles, explosives. That costs a lot of money. To maintain this infrastructure, Hamas budget sent today on half a billion dollars. They need a bank in order to bring this money into the Gaza Strip. And every time they find a bank that agreed to do so, we go and file a lawsuit against this bank in the federal courts in the United States. 
you know, City Bank has a slogan, we're trying to make banking easier. We have a slogan. We're trying to make banking much harder to the terrorists. And indeed, in the course of our operation, Shurat Adin Israel Law Center, we've been getting judgments against Iran, Syria, North Korea for billions of dollars, and we are able to collect them as well. We go after Iranian assets, Syrian assets, we go after their bank accounts, we go after their real estate. For instance, there is a building in New York called 655th Avenue, a skyscraper in Manhattan, owned by the Iranian government. We have a lien on this building. It's going to be sold in the process. We go to the terror victims. We're able to collect more than $300 million so far that went to the hands of the terror victims. This is what we call justice. And recently, we started going after the social media networks. If you were visiting Israel three years ago, October 2015, a little bit more than three years ago, you would not dare to walk the street of Jerusalem without looking back that somebody might follow you with a knife. In the past three and a half years, Israel has been going through hundreds of stabbing attacks. 50 people got killed so far. A lot of others got injured. If you look at the Peters, if you look at those who stab, you'll find that they are very young people. 15 years old, 16 years old, teenagers. And you wonder, what bring these teenagers to go and stab a Jew? What drive them to go to their mother's kitchen, grab a knife, and go and stab Israeli? Knowing that in the end they might get killed or spend the rest of their life in jail. And you realize that this is the incitement to kill. But the incitement that in previous intifadas used to be in the town squares, in the streets, Today is taking place in the social media. You'll find hundreds of posts calling to kill Israelis, pages named Stab the Jew, videos illustrating how to stab, where to push the knife, how to twist the knife, what poison to put on the knife before you go and stab, diagrams of human's body where to slaughter the Jew. And all these terrorists, according to the Shabbat, to our security services had a Facebook page where they got tons of posts and incited them to go and kill, but they themselves posed, I want to become a shaheed, a martyr. It's time to start a third intifada. It's time to deliver the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And after they go and step, you will find tens of thousands of posts endorsing their acts, glorifying it, encouraging others to follow them. All this incitement is taking place in Facebook because Facebook is the most popular social media networks among the Palestinians. To the extent that Prime Minister Netanyahu called this wave of terrorism the Facebook Intifada. And then ministers of the Israeli government went and met with officials of Facebook asking them to take this incitement down. But Facebook refused. Facebook said they're only a neutral bulletin board. They are not involved with the content, they are not involved with the users, and they are not taking a side in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So we decided to take Facebook to court. And to do that, we wanted to get as many plaintiffs as possible. We launched a campaign. Within three days, we got 20,000 Israelis joining this lawsuit. We ran the campaign on our Facebook page. And then we filed an injunction in New York. The injunction was twofold. One, that Facebook will turn down this incitement, but the other, that Facebook will be proactive, 
we'll monitor these words and take them down. And we claim that Facebook has the tools, they have the algorithm to do that. Same way Facebook knows what type of coffee I drink in the morning, they can detect these deadly words and take them down. Facebook filed a motion to dismiss. They claim they were immune according to the Communication Decency Act. This is a law from 1996 that Congress legislated in order to keep the internet open. It grants blanket immunity to social media networks from content that users are posting on their platforms. We filed our response and said, first of all, when Congress legislated this law, which was a very well-intended law, they did not envision this sort of speech that will cause people to go and kill. Such type of words that cause a clear and imminent danger are not protected by freedom of speech. Second, Facebook is not a neutral bulletin board. They are very involved with their users, they are very involved with the content. They offer people to join groups, they offer friendship, they connect between people. They are the ones who connect between Hamas who sit behind the fence in Gaza with no way to leave the Gaza Strip to the Hamas militants who sit in the West Bank receiving orders from them and lessons how to kill. And lastly, we said, Facebook does take a position depending on what side. And in order to prove this, we opened two pages on Facebook, two identical pages. One page calls to kill Palestinians, the other page calls to kill Israelis. And we posted identical posts with identical images, just with one difference. One's against Palestinians, the other against Israelis. And after two days, we asked Facebook to take down both pages. Facebook immediately took down the page that calls to kill Palestinians. They sent us a fair message saying that they checked the page and it does not fit their community standards. But they left the Israeli page standing. They sent us a message saying that they checked the page and it does not violate their community standards. But we know we have a problem. The Communication Decency Act is an absolute law there are no exceptions whatsoever. Anybody can put anything they want on the social media giants and they will be immune. So we're looking to see if there is something that Facebook could not be immune from. And I believe we found it. It's aiding and abetting terrorism. In the United States, no American company is allowed to provide any sort of material support to a designated terror organization. No American company is allowed to provide any sort of services to a designated organization. Facebook is not allowed to provide Hamas with social media services that Hamas utilized in order to spread out their propaganda, to send out their messages, to recruit militants, to incite people to come and kill, to raise funds. This is all prohibited according to the Anti-Terrorism Act, a law from 1996 that imposed civil and criminal liability on those who violate this. This means monetary damages. So we went and filed a lawsuit against Facebook in New York on behalf of five families that lost their loved ones in the recent wave of terrorism in Israel seeking $1 billion compensation. <laughs> One of the families representing is the family of Taylor Force. You may know him from Taylor Force Act. Taylor Force was a 29 years old student, a West Point graduate. A West Point graduate, he came to Israel on a business trip, and then in the second day, he walked on Jaffa Port and got stabbed to death by a Palestinian terrorist. One of the victims is Richard Lakin, a human rights activist, a one that believed in coexistence. He took a ride in Jerusalem on a bus, and two terrorists from the Hamas boarded the bus, shut down the door, and started shooting towards all the passengers in the bus. They hit Richard, they did not kill him, so they took a knife and finished the job. 
One of the victims is Halel Yafa Ariel. Halel was a beautiful girl. Blonde hair, blue eyes, an excellent student, a great ballet dancer. She was 13 years old. And one night, she had a performance in her community, Kiryat Arba. She went with her parents. She danced in the end of the evening. They had a competition. She won. She was the happiest girl on earth. And in the end of the night, they went back home to sleep. She didn't have school the next day. So she stayed in bed with her parents left to work. And then a terrorist from the nearby village entered the community. He did not do it from the front gate. He made a cut in the fence that alerted the security services. <coughs> They came riding on their jeep looking for the one that infiltrated the community. They did not find him. He was hiding behind a bush. When they drove away, he got up. He went to the first house he saw. He tried to open the door. The door was locked, so he went through the window. He wind up in Halel's room. He was holding a knife, and he stabbed her 17 times in her bed until she died. He was 15 years old. He had a Facebook page where before he went to step, he posed, death is a right and I deserve this right. We cannot let Facebook sit in our ivory towers in Palo Alto when the blood is spilled on the street of Jerusalem. We have to find them accountable. We have to teach them as a social media network, they have social responsibility and they have to take this incitement down because words can really kill. These cases are new cases. The court has to decide what governs, the Anti-Terrorism Act or the Communication Decency Act. Do Facebook and Twitter and Google are involved with helping and assisting terrorism, or they're just immune because it has only to do with content. It will go all the way to the Supreme Court, but in the end, I can assure you that Facebook, Twitter, and Google will change our policy and will make sure that there is zero tolerance for terrorism on their platforms. When Israel's enemies realize they cannot beat us military, that despite the wave of terrorism unleashed against us and these horrific wars they launched against us, we are still here, they started to use a different type of weapon, a non-conventional one, but a very devastating one. It's called BDS and Lawfare. They called companies, corporations, co-ops, universities from all over the world to boycott Israel, to sanction it, to divest from it. Because they want to promote what they see is the solution for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, one state solution, a Palestinian state. They want to eliminate Israel as a Jewish state, and they want to build a Palestinian state instead of it. They call all the refugees from 1948, there were 500,000 of them back then, today there are five millions, to come back to Israel, to settle in it under the slogan, let demography win. One of the attempts of this BDS activist is a yearly ritual called the Gaza Flotilla. And it started in May 2010. Bunch of pro-Palestinian BDS activists decided that they are going to breach the sea blockade that Israel has over Gaza. They claimed they were doing it because there is a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. They want to bring merchandise and prostitutes and medicine to Gaza. But they refused for Israel's offer to take this medicine and bring themselves into Gaza because the real motivation, the real reason was 
that they know that Israel will not let them get near the shore of Gaza. They will stop them on the high sea. And then there will be a clash between IDF soldiers to civilians. They will take these photos, they will show them all over the world and then show once again how the IDF is killing civilians. So they rented a big boat, a Turkish boat, called the Mavi Marmara, and put on 500 pro-Palestinians and sailed towards Israel from Turkey. When they reached the extraterritorial water of Israel, the Israeli Navy approached the Mavi Marmara, asked them to stop, asked them to go back to where they came from, but the Mavi Marmara refused. They said, you Jews go back to Auschwitz. And then the Navy made a terrible mistake. They sent helicopters to the air, where they let Navy SEALs climb down with ropes to the boat. The Navy SEALs were unarmed. They actually had paint guns because they thought there were only civilians on the boat. When they reached the bottom of the boat, they were almost lynched to death by IHH, terror organization Ceres, that beat them up with knives, with poles, with guns. There was a bloody fight on the boat. Ten of the terrorists got killed. Nine of the IDF soldiers got severely injured. That caused a disaster to the state of Israel. Not only in terms of PR. They kept showing again and again these pictures of the IDF soldiers beating up civilians. But in terms of foreign relationship, Turkey almost break up relationship with Israel and after a lot of pressure of President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, Netanyahu finally signed an agreement and paid $20 million to the families of the terrorists that got killed on the boat. And then the organizer of the flotilla went and filed a war complaint against Israel and against the IDF soldiers, which is taking place today in the International Criminal Court. So the next year, these BDS activists wanted to repeat their success. But this time, not with 500 pro-Palestinians, but with 1,500, and not only with 15, one boat, but with 15 boats that gather all type of celebrities. They gathered this time from Greece, not from Turkey, that learns its lesson, waiting to set sail towards Israel. We, in Shurat Adin, thought, what can we do in order to stop the boats from sailing? We don't want another clash with the IDF soldiers on the high sea. What we, as lawyers, can block that all the boats need in order to sail. And we came with the idea of maritime insurance. All the boats need maritime insurance in order to sail, and no port will let any boat to sail without maritime insurance. So we sent warning letters to all the maritime insurance companies in the world. There were not so many of them, only 30. And we told them that if they insure the boats that are participating in the flotilla, they are aiding and abetting terrorism. Because the end goal of the boats is to help Hamas in Gaza, which is a designated terror organization. And if they provide any sort of material support to a designated terror organization, they are risking civil and criminal liability in the United States for violating the Anti-Terrorism Act. The first company to answer us was Lloyds of London that say that indeed Hamas is a designated terror organization in Israel, Canada, Europe, and United States. They have no intention to insure the boats, and if we give them the international maritime numbers of the boats, they will cancel their insurance. We went to the Israeli Navy. We asked for some of the numbers. They gave us the numbers of the boats, and after a couple of days, we hear that six of the boats are canceling the participation of the flotilla because lack of insurance. Then we asked the Navy what else we can go after, because we have no knowledge about boats. And they told us we should go after the satellite communication services. This is the GPS, the internet, the telephone coverage. They told us that in the Middle East there is only one company that provides this sort of services. It's called Inmarsat. They sit in Dubai. 
but they have offices in London and Miami as well. So we reached out to Inmarset, but Inmarset refused. Inmarset said that according to the UN treaty, they have to provide any boat with any services they need. So we sued Inmarset. We filed an injunction against them in Miami, and after three days, we read in the New York Times that the biggest boat of them all, the Mavi Marmara, is pulling out of the flotilla because lack of insurance and other communication problems. Then we reached, <laughs> we reached out to uh, the governor of Texas, Governor Rick Perry. Today is the Minister of Energy under Trump administration, but back then he was the governor. Governor Perry heard me in one of his visits to Israel. After my speech, he came forward, he said, I love what you do. The work of Surat Adin is amazing, it's so important, it's so vital. If you ever need my help, please don't hesitate to call. And you know us Israelis, we don't hesitate to call. <laughs> we asked Governor Perry if he'll be willing to send a letter to the United States State Attorney why he's not going after those who raise funds for the flotilla in the United States, because this is a violation of the Neutrality Act. The Neutrality Act is a very old law. Don't ask me how we can up with it, but it's an anti-piracy law. It's from 1789. But it has a clause that says no one in the United States is permitted to take part in a naval expedition against a friendly state of the United States. Israel is an ally of the United States. Governor Perry sent a letter. We put it all over the media. Now everybody knew that the um, United States might go after those who raise funds for the flotilla. And lastly, we approached a law firm in Greece. We asked them to approach the port authorities in Greece to come and check the boats that are waiting to set sail if they fit to sail if they have maritime insurance, if they have satellite communication services, and to check their form. We learned that according to the Greek law, any boat that wants to leave Greece has to fill up a voyage form where they need to indicate which port they are leaving and which port they are going to. We know that none of the boats can fill in the destination Gaza because Gaza does not have a port. So when the port authorities came and checked the form, they saw that everybody puts as their destination Alexandria, Egypt. That was a fraud on the port authorities. They got very mad and impounded all the boats. That afternoon, the organizer of Flotilla held a press conference in Greece saying that because of this lawfare organization, Shuratadin from Tel Aviv, that spreads lies against them, they don't have a choice but to cancel the flotilla. This is only a portion of the cases we're handling in Israel, United States, Europe, and Canada. Every day, we get calls from more and more terror victims who want to fight back, who are seeking justice, and we are dedicated to help. And every day, we see more and more threats against the Jewish state that their answer is in the legal theater. Just for instance, the boycott that Airbnb imposed against Jewish homes in the West Bank. Airbnb deciding that they are no longer going to be activated in occupied territories. This is why they are going to delist Jewish owners. But they did not delist Palestinian owners or Muslims owners or Christians owners, just the Jews. And they didn't delist from other occupied areas in the world, like Northern Cyprus, like Tibet, like Western Sahara. So we filed a lawsuit against Airbnb in the Delaware courts in the United States based on the fair housing law. We said Airbnb discriminates against Jews based on their religion. And Airbnb called us up a month ago to settle the case out of court. This is what we do.
This is what our organization, Shurat Adin, Israel Law Center, will continue to do. We are dedicated to fight terrorism and those who want to delegitimize the state of Israel. We're doing it because the Israeli government cannot do what we do. The Israeli government cannot sue other governments or companies or banks. Their hands are tied. They have political restrictions. They have international treaties that are signed off. They have to be politically correct. We don't. We are private lawyers, private non for profit that represent private people that have one goal, to bankrupt terrorism one lawsuit at a time. And we will fight terrorism in court because we don't have any other choice. We live in Israel. We want to send our kids to school and make sure they're coming back safe. We want to ride our buses, we want to shop in our malls, we want to sit in our cafes. We want to live safely in our country because this is our country and the only one. going to be hard. We know it's going to be a very bad battle. But we are sick and tired of these terrorists sitting in the military court in Israel, looking at the judge's eyes, smiling at him, and promising him that they will win. They will not win. We will win because we are fighting for our national survival. And this is why we need your help. You that believe in the right of the Jewish people to live in the Jewish state, in the Holy Land. We cannot do it without you. Together we will fight, we will pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you very much.